great to be here. I've never actually followed a prime minister on stage, so um, please go easy on me. I also have no idea how it was just introduced, so I'm just going to have to go with it and assume it was right. Um, today I want to talk to you about uh, metrics-driven engineering at Etsy uh, and the way that we've been, we've been doing this for the last three years uh, while I've been at the company. Um, this talk is sort of focused on two different areas, uh, both process and, and tooling. Uh, I don't really know what the makeup of the audience is here, and, and I'd, I'd love to see sort of a raise of hands. This is supposed to be like a geeks and bosses sort of uh, conference. How many bosses are in the room? A few. How many geeks are in the room? Okay, great, great, okay, excellent. You're my, you're my crowd. Um, so I'm gonna just whiz through the process stuff then and, and uh, get right to the fun parts. Uh, actually, no, I'll, I'll go through all of it for you. Uh, Etsy, how many people know of Etsy? I know that it's not as, as wide a brand in, in Europe, so uh, just briefly, Etsy's a marketplace. We connect buyers and sellers. Um, the sellers on the site are sp specifically uh, independent and creative businesses. So what you find on the site has nothing to do with like mass market and commodity goods. Uh, you find stuff that is handmade, um, much like these rings, and, and you, a lot of the types of things you find are handmade, uh, unique, and uh, crafted by the people who are actually selling it. Um, so now we've been building this site for uh, just over eight years now, and over the last three years we've been sort of accelerating the rate of development and iteration on the site. And so we want to collect metrics along, uh, along with our development process so that we can measure how things are going. And we want to be able to answer a lot of questions uh, about the site as we're running it. Things like how many new shops are being created every day, and how many new products are being listed within the marketplace, and how many are being sold on a daily basis. And then we sort of go down, and get down the chain a little bit and get deeper and we, into things like how fast are we generating the pages uh, on the server for every uh, request that's made, how many error conditions are happening, how many documents are being stored in our search index. And at the lowest level, uh, we look at how, many ser how are the servers doing in the, in the network health. Um, are we saturating CPU or memory on any, any parts of the clusters? Uh, how many uh, queries per second are we executing on our databases? And what does the out total outgoing bandwidth look like? All that stuff generally should be pretty steady unless we're doing something that we know is going to affect it. So we collect these metrics at essentially three different levels, three distinct levels. Uh, and when I say metrics, uh, generally what this refers to is, is trend lines, so a historical, historical trend line of some value. Uh, I'll go through a couple of examples of those different levels. This is, this is one that's at the, at the business level, and this is a graph of our completed transactions. And so we run, uh, a lot of our traffic comes out of North America, and, and you can tell uh, this great dip uh, that is pointed out in the, in the, with the red arrows is, is our nighttime traffic. So during the day, you can see we've got two little, little bumps in our traffic. Um, as we go down the stack into application level metrics, um, these, these graphs are representative of what our photo storage and resize times take. And you can again see, this is only a single day uh, chart, but you can see the same sort of dip. So what's happening is as we've got fewer uploads happening on the site, uh, the time it takes for storage and resizing decreases as well. There's less, um, less competition. At the lowest level, we've got uh, system metrics. And um, these, are, these are metrics across a couple of different clusters. Again, you see the same sort of correlation of, of time, um, across time of, of the load on different systems. There's one in, in, in particular anomaly that I'll point out here, uh, which is just when we run backups on our, on our database servers. We, we ship backups off across the network. Um, so the point is that we've got this great visibility across all of these different levels, um, all the way down from business metrics down to uh, service, server metrics. And different changes that we make are going to uh, impact across all those different levels. Uh, if we optimize the way our application is running um, and, and the way that it's, say, it's storing a new listing on the site, then we would assume that faster storage times uh, will show as an application metric. And server metrics might show that we're using less memory and I.O. while we're um, in the code that's being used to, uh, that's, that's been uh, optimized. Shop owners might benefit from this at the business level because they're, they're seeing faster time responses and they may uh, end up creating more listings and spending more time on the site because, they're, because it's performing very well. So we orient our product development teams, our engineering teams, around small distributed teams. 
And we give them the tools uh, for every one of those teams to make an impact on their own. Uh, our release management goes through individual teams, which is why metrics uh, and continuous deployment go hand in hand for us. First and foremost, having metrics available that we collect in this way gives us a way to identify goals that we want to shoot for. We might look at the, the general rate of user registrations on the site and say, well, we want to see if we can, we can impact that and raise it. Uh, we might also want to uh, improve the speed at which our search result pages are loaded. Uh, or maybe we want to reduce the errors that are happening uh, behind the scenes at a low level in our, in our logs. So having trend lines, we, we can detect where they are and, and how we move them over time. And critically, these also let you know when something's gone wrong. And so we, expose, we, we expect most of our metrics to maintain a sort of stable flow over time. Uh, but it's incredibly important for us to know if we've changed something that's uh, going to have an adverse effect. Now, everybody on our engineering team is responsible for deploying code. Uh, we, we set expectations with every team where uh, every team is building new things every week. The, the goal is to have something that's shippable after the, at the end of the week, even if it's small, and even if it's something that's not exposed to the public. Um, but we sort of iterate around this weekly, uh, weekly ship. And that starts on your first day at Etsy. So as a new engineer, you join the team, and you're going to be shipping code pretty quickly. And you know, how would you possibly change a website, a production website, when we've got over 200 people on your first day? We break it down to a really simple exercise. Um, we have a page on the site that just illustrates all the people who work for the company and, and uh, how they contribute. And your first task as an engineer is to put yourself onto this page, which isn't a very difficult task, but it gets you through the whole process of knowing uh, how the source code is laid out, where the repos are, um, how your dev sandbox is set up, you get into your editor, you learn about our uh, build and, and testing tools, and then you go through a release process. So you figure this out on your first day um, before you leave the office. And the second day, you get to do all things like uh, filling out your insurance forms and things like that. So this is what continuous deployment looks like in practice. It means that you are the one writing the server in dev, and you're the one who's migrating it through, uh, committing it to trunk, um, running it through tests, and uh, deploying it to production. That happens on your own, and we use really simple tools to get you there. Um, we've built our deployment and, uh, and testing mechanism so that we have one button that takes you to a build stage, one button that takes you to, pr to production. The entire t cycle takes about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how big the change is happening. And deploying, after when you click on this button, it takes about 90 seconds for all of your changes to go out to our production tier, which means we're running really, really quickly throughout the day. Across all of our different teams, um, both in engineering and operations, uh, we're making changes to the production site over 50 times a day. So we want to know that things are going to be stable, and we want to catch things early. And this probably looks like the software engineering equivalent of a rodeo. And I don't know whether you know of American rodeos very much over here, but I think that the, uh, the, the slide here is somewhat illustrative. Um, it looks crazy. Uh, it doesn't seem like something that could possibly be very safe. And so having metrics in place and having, having visibility into how the system is working and how the system is changing is really important for us to, uh, important for us to an important safeguard for us to have uh, to manage the system. And of course, there are other safeguards involved as well. Before we, before we go to production, uh, we go through a regular peer review, uh, which can be code reviews, it can be architectural reviews, it can be ops reviews. Um, it all depends on the level of change that you're making, the level of impact. We've got thousands of automated tests that are going to run, um, anywhere from very quick, low-level unit tests to very high-level functional tests that have a lot, of, a lot of coverage. These are the pre-flight checks that happen before we deploy anything. Now, the site has been pretty successful over the last couple of years. We've got, a, we've got a decent amount of scale here. Um, in last month, we did over 100 million in goods sold. And uh, last month didn't quite hit a billion and a half page views, but we've been regularly touching up against there. Um, so when we're, constantly, when we're talking about constantly in integrating change with the site, you have to wonder about risk and, and failure. And there's something to be said about it. But this is not what our mentality is about it. Even if we write software that is perfect, we don't always know that the test cases that we build are going to be perfect. 
We also rely on outside software for our servers. Um, we use Apache, MySQL, Linux, and things like that, things that we don't necessarily control. We've got lots of hardware. We've got data centers, um, power grids, and weather. We got hit by Superstorm Sandy last, last fall. It, was, um, it raised some questions about how things were going to go. And in a previous job, I had a data center run into a truck that took out half of our, uh, half of our cluster. And so having visibility into how the health of the system is, is going through these types of things helps us make decisions as we go forward. So failure is actually inevitable. This is why we have our engineer, engineering and operations teams work really, really quickly. Um, we run operability reviews across these teams so that engineers think about operating the sites themselves. Uh, deploying code is part of operating the site. So, um, in practice, we're sort of sharing the responsibility and accountability for the uptime and, and availability of the site. Metrics help engineers understand the impact of changes that they're making from front to back. So how an application change is going to impact the entire cluster of machines as well. So we're collecting all this data in real time and we want to be able to put that to use. Um, that means we put it in front of humans' eyes and we also use this data to trigger automated alerts. We'll go into all of those later. Um, an important thing about, about data collection for us is, is this sort of notion of open access of, of data. We, we, put these, uh, we put our metrics up on the walls. Uh, we regularly have people from outside the company wandering around the office on, on tours and things like that. Um, we want sort of cross-team exposure to metrics that are happening on the site. So even if I don't have any clue what these things are on the wall, and I see some kind of dip, I might ask somebody on the team who's sitting next to those dashboards and, and I'll learn something new about how that team works or learn a story about how that team uh, was successful or failed at something. Uh, and we all learn from each other doing this. We also put these right onto uh, individuals' computers. So this is one of our engineers who's going through the process of deploying. And what you see on the colored graphs on his, uh, on his desktop there are um, some of the graphs that we use to monitor a deployment and make sure all the high-level business metrics and all the really low-level things like um, outgoing bandwidth from the data center are stable. If you make a deploy and you change the bandwidth of going out of the data center, you've probably done something wrong. That doesn't happen very often, by the way. So when, when I talk to people about building metrics like this and, and adding this process to the team, a question that often comes up is who's responsible for building them? And the concern is, I've got engineers to write my application. They're not supposed to be writing metrics and monitoring the site. That's the ops team. The ops team is responsible for maintaining availability and maintaining the network and the data centers and monitoring and things like that. But for us, the engineers are the ones who are actually writing the application. They're the ones who know what the changes are they're trying to make. They're the ones who know where to get at the data uh, from the application to put it into a graph. So this is a point where uh, when we talk about uh, DevOps, this is the sort of intersection. This is a shared responsibility. Um, logging, graphing, trending, and alerting are the, are the pieces where uh, developers and operations really overlap in our, in our group. And metrics end up being a part of every feature. So if you're planning a new feature, uh, part of the feature development process is to identify what metrics you're going to be collecting about, uh, about the application. And uh, config flags go along with that too. So we have changes that we can make to the site. We all, always push out uh, config flags with it that we're able to use to turn on and off um, different pieces of the application. If there's anything I've learned, about changing culture and process, because we didn't have this when I started. Um, it is that every change that you make on, on a team has to be weighed for both value and simplicity. High value changes don't need to be all that simple because the team understands uh, the value that's going to come out of it and they're willing to put in the effort, extra work. If your team doesn't already value a change, you have to figure out how to make it simple. And when, we started, when I started at Etsy and we didn't have a team that had a lot of metrics in place, and we didn't get a lot of value out of it, it was hard to convince people that adding those, uh, adding those tools would be useful to them and the, the, that they would get value out of having that data. Um, our target over time has been a low upfront configuration for any new data, um, potentially zero configuration, and as, as few lines of code, uh, which approach one. 
So that's, like I said, I was going to try to get through process pretty quickly, and, and that's the process bit. I'm going to talk about specifically some of the tools and, and how we've integrated those uh, into our system. So our approach has been to rely on tools that are easy to set up, easy to manage, and easy to contribute to. The ones that are uh, labeled in yellow here are the ones that, we, that I'm going to talk about specifically, but everything on this graph makes up our, our, uh, net, our application monitoring and alerting stack. Um, by the way, I'll have, a, I'll have a link at the end of this uh, slide deck where you can get these slides later this week when I post them. Uh, so the first, first tool I want to talk about just briefly is Ganglia. And uh, this is the first tool we used a lot uh, at Etsy for collecting data from both our, both our, um, our network and servers, but also from our application. So this is, uh, this is an aggregated graph of a number of different nodes. These are uh, average response times for web requests. And every, every one of those different colors is a different uh, machine in the cluster. So aggregated across time, you see it's generally a pretty smooth line. And we see a little bit of an anomaly here where, where something backed up. Um, but Ganglia in itself is, is cluster oriented. It's, it's, built for, um, it's built for monitoring machines uh, and many of them together and, and seeing sort of how they all relate to each other. That aggregated graph is a great example of it. It's not as, as it turns out, it's not as friendly for individual application metrics, um, but you can start with it. And, and there's a, uh, a utility with Ganglia called GmetaD uh, that allows you to write your own custom metrics. So you're not stuck with whatever uh, comes right out of the box, but you can write your own. And uh, there's a number of community uh, submitted metrics that you can pull from their site as well. Graphite's another tool that we use, and, it, and we get tremendous use out of Graphite. Um, this is more positioned for individual application metrics. And these two trend lines here represent response times for a particular area of our site. And we're measuring two different response times. One is for uh, visitors who are signed into the site, and one is for visitors who have not signed in. And you can see there's roughly about a, a 15 to 20% difference between these two because when you're signed in, you have more data on the page. There's more information about who you are, what your, your user account, and things like that. And, and that, unsurprisingly, takes a little bit extra time to render the page. So I'll get to how we put values into Graphite in, in a minute. Um, but Graphite's, like I said, it's oriented around, around being a single instance. It's better for these like, individual uh, application metrics. You can create new metrics on the fly. All you need to do is start sending a name and value to, to Graphite, and it'll create the new, um, the new trend line for you and the, and the data store for it. And you, it also has this very sort of rich API in its, in its URLs for when you generate an image uh, out of Graphite for a, for a trend line, um, you can make changes to the colors, and, the, and, and you can sort of massage the data in different ways. You can correlate different metrics together. Um, so that makes it incredibly useful for us to see how different pieces of data relate to each other. I'm going to try to breeze through this. This is probably the most boring slide you're going to see in, the, in, in these two days. Um, log formats are, seem like you know, uh, pretty, uh, pretty basic. It turns out getting this stuff right is really important for uh, being able to parse and, and aggregate different, different things out of your line. Uh, I'm sorry, out of your logs. So I think it's really important to get this, um, get some details out about this. We run Apache, and, and um, out of the box, there's a bunch of standard fields that you get out of Apache in the, in the access log. We've augmented that with a bunch of additional things. We probably throw about 30 extra fields into the Apache log. Um, I haven't really seen this done at other companies I've worked at, uh, but I find it, it's very successful for us. So alongside all the standard things you would get, we also log things like execution time and, and the, the amount of memory that's taken um, by the PHP process that's running um, for that particular request. And we also add in um, things that we can segment on, like whether the, whether the member is signed in or signed out, whether we're rendering a desktop view or a mobile view, uh, whether we are going through a translation process. By default, everything is in English on the site, and we have to do additional work to translate. So having those additional, um, those additional items allow us to sort of segment and figure out uh, as you saw in the previous graph, the difference between performance for signed in and signed out users. In PHP, this is really easy. Uh, I'm going to sort of breeze through this, uh, but there's a, there's a function for this. In other languages, you could write your own ad hoc um, log format. The important thing is having these pieces of data in there. Um, 
these two, these two sections show what our log format generally looks like and, and an example of, of uh, one entry. This comes from Googlebot. And as you can see, Googlebot's response was a, uh, a desktop template. Um, there was no user ID because Googlebot, surprisingly, doesn't ever sign into our site. And, and what's really frustrating is they never actually buy anything from us, no matter how much they time spend uh, browsing through the site. Along with access logs, we also want to have like really rich information in our in our error logs um, and debugging logs. So we've made a one line part of our logging class is one line to collect this stuff. Um, we name a log level, which might be like errors or warnings or fatals, uh, and we also have a namespace so we can sort of bucket things together. And that class adds a bunch of other additional metadata uh, into the log entries. So obviously you would get the server name and the time. You also get a, a unique request ID. So every single request ID uh, that goes into the logs can be, all the log entries can be aggregated together for that particular request. And you end up with a bunch of stuff that just pours onto your screen like this if you're tailing through the logs. If you've ever done this on a production machine that has you know, tens or hundreds of, of log entries per second, this becomes really useless. Um, you could colorize the output and get some relative sense from these, from these log levels, but what we really want to see is a picture. We want to see uh, a historical trend line and, and how these things are related to each other. And so this is where another tool that, we, that we've been using for a long time, uh, Logster, comes into play. It allows us to aggregate these log entries together and create graphs out of them. And Logster is a really simple framework for us. Uh, it's a little bit of Python. Uh, we, it runs right out of cron, so you can determine what your, um, what your aggregation interval is going to be by, simply by um, your cron, set, cron tab setup. Um, and Logster just keeps a cursor on your log file. So as new entries come in, um, over the course of a minute or five minutes, let's say, it will allow you to parse through the new entries that have shown up um, since the last run. So if you just keep going through that interval, um, you just parse through what changed last. And then you can output it to any of these back-end collectors. Um, Amazon CloudWatch was something that was apparently added recently into, into the um, open source um, repo. So there's, there's, <laughs> it's not distracting. There's three steps to, um, to, to using Logster. You write a Logster parser. Uh, essentially, you need to define a, a regular expression that identifies the value you're abstracting from the log. Uh, you do whatever kind of aggregation you want, whether you want a sum or whether you want to look for maximum values or percentiles. And then you take those and just jam them into these generic metric objects. And depending on how you run Logster from the command line and define whatever your backend collector is going to be, um, that metric object will just spit it out in the right format and you get pictures. Um, this is really useful. Where it really shines is where you've got an application that already has logs. So if you've got something like Apache or, or some other server software that um, already generates a log file, you can use Logster to pull that data together um, and aggregate um, graphs from it. Uh, it may also be useful for you if you've got something you want to track in your application, but you also want to have more information about what's happening. So we might want to track errors that are happening, but we also might want to have in a log file uh, why, those, why those errors resulted. Um, in other cases, we don't actually care about the log file. We just want counts or timers. And so another tool that we use is StatsD, which is a, uh, a network collector. Um, it listens for, for um, metrics that we send to it over UDP. Uh, again, it's just names and values, and we just shoot those over to StatsD, and they, it gets collected and, and sent, over to, uh, sent over to Graphite. So in this case, we're just collecting counts from our application of, um, these are all different types of images that we have uploaded to our image tier. And this is, like, this is a month's worth of, of data. So you're seeing week, weekly um, uh, intervals on the graphs. Like I said, this is, this is over UDP. It flushes to graphite every 10 seconds, so you get like almost instantaneous resolution. And the important piece of it, again, is it's one line of code to put this stuff into your application. Um, we've got a client that's in PHP that we had released initially, and we've had, uh, I think there's at least 10 other client libraries that are, that are in, on GitHub uh, that have been submitted by different people. So all we need to do is say we want to increment this particular metric and we end up with a trend line. Because like I said earlier, Graphite doesn't actually care about 
um, setup of new metrics, we can just start sending them to Graphite and they show up. So uh, simply adding this line into, your, into our application and deploying that, once we start getting traffic on that piece of the application, we start seeing a trend line. We can do that with timing as well. If we collect, um, if we want to track the difference of time in milliseconds here, collecting a variable, um, and we're collecting, the, you know, some kind of operation that we're doing in, in our code, uh, we can just send that over to StatsD as well. And what we end up getting out of that is actually four different metrics. You see three of them here, but StatsD will automatically do the aggregation, uh, uh, aggregation on, on timing data, so you get the upper, the lower, the average time, and the 90th percentile. Now, I'd mentioned the graphite being really useful. There's, there continues to be more things that we add into it. Um, all you need to do for graphite is send a name value and, and, and a timestamp of when something happened. So you could send any sort of data that you want to graphite. And when we go through a deployment, when we push that button to deploy to production, we shoot out a metric um, from the deploy tool that indicates that we have just pushed to production. Um, so essentially, we're tracking events. Uh, we, all we do is we send a, a value of one, uh, but then using one of the URL functions in Graphite, we can turn that value of one into a vertical line. And what, it, what that ends up meaning is that we've got events correlated with trend lines. So depending on what this trend line is, uh, it could mean different things. It could mean that maybe uh, an application is taking more time and it's, run, it's running more slowly. It could mean that maybe we've got more errors running in the system, or maybe it means that we've got more users uh, going through some part of the application. Generally, as we go through the day and, we, and we're constantly making deploys to the site, we expect these things to stay stable, and this looks good. This validates that as, that as we're making changes in production, that the tests we ran before deploying actually held up and they had good coverage. Um, we weren't surprised by anything. Frequently, we'll run into something um, that may or may not show up to end users, but we'll run into something that we didn't catch in a test. Um, we will catch it in a metric. So here you're seeing a deploy line followed by an increase in warnings and then two further deploys that, that it took to actually silence that warning. And this is a little bit different. As you notice, this line doesn't line up with a vertical line at all, which indicates that something changed in the system, but it didn't have anything to do with us changing the system. And when you find something that is wrong with your system, you want to figure out the culprit of it pretty quickly. Um, knowing whether we should be talking to somebody who is deploying code or whether we should be looking at different systems um, is, is a quick thing that we want to figure out. Now, simplicity for all this is really the key. Uh, we, we, we collect currently over 200, uh, 250,000 metrics at Etsy, and figuring out how to sort through all that is, is a real challenge for us at this point. One of the things we do is we want to aggregate from, you know, from a, uh, an engineering team standpoint, we want to aggregate graphs that make sense together onto dashboards where they can be viewed together. Um, we put together some dashboard code. It's, it's also in GitHub. Um, the, important, the importance here is that it's really easy to create new dashboards. It doesn't matter how pretty they are, actually. Um, it does matter that the time frames are consistent. So if you're looking at one of these squares or two of these squares together and they're, and they're different widths, you at least want to know that they cover an hour or they cover five hours. Um, you also want to be able to collect these from different, different systems. So um, in this case, we actually have a graph from, from New Relic. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that tool. Um, but that's an outside vendor that we've, that we've uh, put onto this graph uh, and this dashboard. And then we've got a number of different um, business and application level metrics uh, from across the stack, uh, all in one place that we can, that we can watch and, and look for irregularities any, in any of them. We have over 50 of our engineers who have contributed more code to our dashboards, uh, over 100 dashboards in use in, in the company. <coughs> So doing this kind of thing is pretty clunky. Editing you know, all the different uh, URLs for making those images from all the different systems. Um, the importance is to make, make some easy API uh, that makes sense across all those systems and makes it easy for engineers to get in and get out. And I only said 100 dashboards, but I also said a quarter million metrics. Um, we can't really look at all of these at once. Even if we have all these dashboards, we're not always just like sitting around and watching them. So we also have uh, machines look at them. Again, um, Graphite's URLs are hackable. 
So while this one displays a graph, I can add a, add a uh, parameter that will just tell Graphite to, instead of creating an image, just dump uh, comma separated values. And if you sort of just visually inspect there, you've got a couple of values that are over 10, and we might consider that to be our, um, that might be a warning threshold for us. If you marry this URL together with curl and Nagios, then you can start monitoring um, your graphs automatically and paging on them. But if you've got data that's trending like this, it's hard to tell where your critical threshold should be. Because if you set it above your top, uh, your, your biggest peak, then if something is an anomaly uh, further down in the trough, you may not detect it. Um, so there's an algorithm we added to, to Graphite and it's released publicly um, that implements uh, the Holt Winters confidence bands. And so you can see these, these bands are a measurement of historical activity and they try to give you a sense of, uh, of where your trend line should fit. And there's an aberration algorithm as well that will tell you where you've, where you've gone outside of those confidence bands. So imagine that you add raw data to that and all you're looking for is non-zero values to alert on. That means you've got business metrics and you've got confidence bands and you can alert on them. So wrapping up, I've got, um, I've really talked about collecting metrics at the top level. I've talked about correlating metrics and events and alerting on metrics and then correlating metrics and metrics together with dashboards. All this together gives us really high level and real time visibility of our entire system. It allows us to see how the business and application are performing. We want to quickly be able to know that's, that if something is going wrong so that we can quickly respond to it and fix things. In closing, the keys I want to leave you with are add metrics to your system so you have this sort of visibility if you don't already have it. Make sure that they're accessible to everybody in your company and across teams. Don't, don't hide that data. Um, make them required for all features that go out. Don't, don't have one team that is very data oriented and others that are not. Uh, and make sure that they're dead simple for engineers to add to your application. Um, they will find, you, find value out of, out of them and, and, um, and add more of them. So that concludes what I have for you today. I want to thank you for your attention. Um, if we have a minute or two, I'll take, a, take one or two questions.